Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Stories or Soul Food, new episode. Yep, new episode of an unspecified number. Yeah, 22. Welcome. Welcome back to Stories or Soul Food. And uh, I wanted to start out with a little reference here. More evidence that Nate has hit the big time is people are publishing scholarly academic articles <laughs> about, about your fiction. And I'm not even dead yet, although they might think that I am. No. I've surprised many people by not being dead. No, really? Yep. They thought you were dead. Yep. Many different author appearances where people are saying, like, but how are you still alive? <laughs> what? <laughs> I is, thought is you it... were from like olden times. <laughs> and you said, I'm actually still pretty young. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm only just starting, actually. I'm way ahead of C.S. Lewis. Way ahead. Yeah. Ish. I don't remember. No, totally. Didn't he, he didn't write a kid's fiction until he was late 50s, right? Yeah, there we go. I'm on track. So you've already done... If is it, it was, is it if, 12 or 13? Kids? 13. If we were finishing 13 right now. So fin- The Silent Bells in Serial is the 13th novel. And you are, you've and already then, crested on that one. Then non, just yeah. cruising downhill down. Slope, down yeah. Downhill slope on that one. And then uh, nonfiction and other stuff. So yeah. Do we, can we ask if there's more fiction coming from you after The Silent Bells or do we, do I we mean, not get yes, to know that? that would be my assumption. Well, I assume so too, but I, <laughs> I wanted something more concrete. <laughs> I have, there are many, many stories on my slate. There are many, many ideas on the bulletin board and in the notebooks. Yeah. So I've been keeping the same notebook since 2001. And so every now and then I flip through and crack myself up with ideas or lines or descriptions or, se- or sentences. Yeah. Um, my favorite sentence that I found in my notebook is, I am Kendra. The last passenger pigeon. <laughs> and I did that. I just laughed, sat there and just laughed and laughed. I was like, I don't, like, I completely forgot writing that down and it makes me so incredibly happy. It's just in the notebook. So that has a great ring to it. Yeah. The last, Kendra, the last passenger pigeon. I don't know what it's for. I don't know if it's going to do anything other than just amuse me in my notebook. Yeah. It inspires the, uh, I think I tweeted it Mo, at some point. Mo Willems. You know, yeah, yeah, pigeon needs a bath. I mean, it yeah. sounds like there's a, a rich history of kids' yeah, books. Pigeon about. stories. So yeah, there'll be more fiction. I'm sure there'll be yeah. more fiction. Okay. Well, I guess that's kind of an intro because this is the official call for all N.D. Wilson related questions. Right. We've actually had a lot of, I don't know if Brian has, I've had a lot of people ask me to work through my own novels on this podcast. So just to, you know, kind of talk through some of the inspiration and the typology and the illusions yep. and all that kind of stuff. Yep. So. Okay, fine. We can do that. We did. I think we, yeah. we have talked about cupboards. Yep. Somewhat. That at turned least in, into a bit of a discussion of the publishing industry. Yeah, it did. That's true. And people wanted more of that And they, they liked it. Whatever, whatever we want. So if you have a question about any of my books, so Lee Pike Ridge, Boys of Blur, The 100 Cupboards Trilogy, and then Prequel with The Door Before, Ashtown Burials is the most frequently requested. And then uh, Outlaws of Time, actually, there's quite a, quite a bit around yeah. Outlaws of Time as well. And we touched on that with, you know, in the discussion of science fiction. Yeah. But Nate, anyway, but Nate, so if you have questions, yeah. if you have questions about any of those things, send them in and we'll cover them in some future podcast. Right. Nate may not want to talk about himself this much, but we will do it nonetheless. We're going to Step do by it. step. 13 episodes in a row about me. <laughs> 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 and we're just gonna gonna hold you to the ground. No, we won't. We won't. Do, we won't do that. In fact, let's do three episodes about each volume. So let's just. This sounds most... like uh, pastors preaching through Ephesians and the old school <laughs> reformed. We will try to answer your questions, and we will try to work in the different books, the different novels in my canon. Yeah. In different, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't know that we want to do a full podcast about them. 
I think we but do. I think we do. We'll see what happens. No promises. No. We'll see what happens. So I, yeah. I do I do enjoy talking about the stories I have written, but um yeah. you know, we can tie them into other themes. Yeah. I think uh I just finished reading aloud hundred cupboards to my eight and five and occasionally the three year old. Nice. And now we're on to dandelion fire. And so awesome. I, I'm feeling primed for this You're these ready. episodes. Yeah. Okay. So that said, if you have questions, send them in so that we can talk about them. Uh, at some future date. Yeah. And today we're actually not talking about them. No, not, we're not. I, I actually did want to talk about animals today. Okay. You're, I think, uh, inspired by this academic essay I saw that basically asked why you use mythological creatures or why you reference them. That was kind of her, you know, when they say you're writing an academic paper, you have a question that you're answering. Okay. So why do you use creatures that are, you know, mythological or mythological references or cryptozoological creatures. I'm a little confused by the question. Where did this article appear? Um, it appeared in some university publication. Okay. I, I haven't seen the whole thing. And we don't need to d discuss that exactly, but... Should we give her a shout out if she wrote it? Is it a female? I think we should. Marilyn E. Burton, she wrote an article called Man as Creature, Allusions to Classical Beasts in N.D. Wilson's Ashtown Burials. Okay. Well, basically, she says, if I can crib her abstract here, quote, Wilson explores, well, this is going to be boring to read an entire quote, but basically she shows that it is no strange and terrifying mythical beast, but man in his willful sinfulness, that's the true monster. And mm. uh, I always wonder what authors think when people academize or- Academize. Ac academize? That's probably the word. <laughs> Let's make up a word. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, and then the other part of the half of this question is you do nature documentaries. I do. And they seem like two different things. One tied to the reality of the world and one tied to the fiction of the past. Yeah. So I think to, to answer the question about why I try to use mythical beasts, and I'm not sure which beast she's uh, referring to. But Jaculus vipers are an example in Ashtown burials. Mm -hmm. Obviously, lots of dragons, I think, probably is what the main thing. Dra dragons. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but the dragons I use in Ashtown, the dragon jinn are, you know, they're out of uh, Middle Eastern mythology, but specifically connected to the spirits that sinned in the time of Noah and Solomon having mopped them up. Yeah. So old, old stories about genies in lamps. Why are they in lamps? Why? What, what is, why? Like this whole genre of story about lamps. I guess I've never asked that. And the answer is, and this is to, this is not to be academic. This is just to sort of broad brush it, is in the old, old stories, Solomon captured these demons, these jinn, and he sealed them in these prisons. And he would use the seal was the name of God. And so he would trap them in this, a lamp, for example seal it with the name of God, and then they threw them in the ocean. So the seal, the, the demon, the jinn could not break the seal because it was the name of God. And, you know, they were just out there stuck. And so there's a whole lot of stories about fishermen, you know, finding a lamp. And then when they rub it to actually see what it is, they rub off the name of God. Oh, okay. And the demon escapes. And in most of the old stories, this is always a horror story. It is never Aladdin with three wishes. You know, what we've done with our Disneyfication, and I like Robin Williams <laughs> as much as anybody else, <laughs> and that genie in Aladdin. But the old stories are, the old, old stories are terrifying, you know, with what happens to you when, when you release these things. So, so it's not like hitting the jackpot when you no, rub off the name no. of God. Okay. So what I've, I've used that actually in the Silent Bells and I've referred to it in other places in my fiction. And so I use uh, glass spheres, which are Asian. So Japanese and others would blow glass spheres as floats, you know, for their fishing nets. I found them to be pretty cool and mysterious. A lot of them would put hot glass over the hole when they'd finished, you know, blowing the sphere and seal it. And there'd be a, there's a seal over that hole. So I use that and this is these are the orbs in which Solomon trapped the jinn. And so they've been collected in different places. So I'm I'm pulling from very old Middle Eastern storytelling in doing that and that's not exactly connected to beasts. 
Yeah. But it's but I do variations of that in everything I write. So I try to hat tip the old stories and I want to I'm I'm not trying to invent something wholly new ever. Right. I'm always trying to connect what I do to the old, the legacy, you know, the the ancient myths, the old stories, et cetera. So yeah. The reason why I use, yeah. like, especially I like to use creatures, for example, I like to use creatures out of mythology that other people don't know about or that have forgotten about. So, Jaculus vipers are an example of that. Uh, Herodotus talks about them. Others talk about them, the flying serpents uh, near Egypt. And, you know, they're, they're discussed by historians. They're in, you know, people argue over whether or not they're in the Old Testament, but they're definitely in the old stories. Mm -hmm. And so, I put wings on snakes and here, you know, here's yeah. the... Here's the story. Now, Leon, the turtle in Ashdown, I have to say. Yeah. One of my favorite characters. Side <laughs> well, characters, I should a say. A lot of people's favorite character is Leon, the giant, enormous alligator snapping turtle. And that was just something that was a current agenda item for me was taking things from the real, like you said, nature documentaries, things that are in fact real. Yeah. Nobody denies the existence of alligator snapping turtles. They are bizarre. They are truly bizarre creatures, enormous, ugly, powerful, funny. They, wig they wiggle the tongue, right? They've got the worm in the back of the throat that they open their mouth and, and try to bait fish into their mouths with this wriggly thing in the back of their throat, which works. They've got a giant alligator tail and you know spines up their shell, asymmetrical nostrils, just lots of weird things about them often. Yeah. And they're huge too, they right? They can get big. But the concept there, what I, I was just thinking is like, okay, so- if the Fountain of Youth was in fact in Florida, where Ponce de Leon and others were searching for it, it would be in the Everglades. It'd be some swampy corner, you know, of the glades where there are these creatures, reptiles who never stop growing. So crocs, right. gators, turtles, you know, they can they can grow and grow and grow and grow till they die. So imagine an alligator snapping turtle unknowingly settling down in the swamp of youth, <laughs> like in the, <laughs> and just living for centuries and centuries and centuries. They have, by the way, found alligator snapping turtles pretty recently with Civil War musket balls embedded in the shells still. Like these. Ooh, okay, so that's at least 150 years. Yeah, but also big enough, old enough at the time of the Civil War to have a shell that could resist a musket ball. Okay. So, so you know, like they've a couple been, centuries. Yeah, have been around. I love the inspiration for Leon because, well, you hear it just here on, <laughs> <laughs> on the podcast. I guess that's funny that... Uh, that idea, yeah, of a reptile. Stuck in the fountain of youth. <laughs> yeah, tying to the legend and just growing. So, and this is one of the things that I like to do is I like to kick out the walls and kind of go sideways a little bit with concepts. So, a lot of uh, storytellers that annoy me are people who, they come up with a concept and they apply that concept to exactly one thing. And they never push it out sideways into the other unintended consequences. <laughs> you know, like oh, yeah. if there were a fountain of youth in the swamps of the Everglades, what would that result in? Yeah. Why are we so focused on just the explorer the trying to it's find just it? On, yeah. You know, it's just tuck everlasting. It's just a person who finds it. It's like, no, there'd be a whole bunch of undying creatures all around that thing in the animal world. So I love tapping. Really, my favorite are creatures that probably actually existed that are currently crypto, you know, where historians, ancient historians talk about them. We deny that they now exist. And so I love to kind of, you know, point kids at them, draw their right. attention to them, and then have them discover that I did not make them up. You know, this is, yeah. you know, these are creatures I think might have been real. You know, they could have actually been around. So that's thus the winged vipers, that kind of thing. I mean, the vipers are the only thing you put wings on, though, because we got <laughs> the ragant. Yeah, the ragant in the cupboards trilogy is one that I just truly, fully made up. Then people think it's mythical. Because at the time, I don't know where it came from. I don't know why it occurred to me other than the, the image was just really comical and made me extremely happy. The idea of a basset hound sized rhinoceros, you know, saggy baggy rhinoceros, the size of a yeah. basset hound with giant wings and a huge amount of dignity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I've always, I really love animals that are comic, clearly comedy, and yet right. have an intense sense of self dignity. Elephants, I view that way, where they are huge and slow and ponderous, and, and we can find them very noble. But if you look at them objectively for a second, they are pure comedy, giant ears and nose to the ground. Yeah. And yet 
extremely dignified. They can do yeah. this nobility thing. They can do this dignity thing. So that's what I wanted to do with the ragging. But anyway, as far as man as creature is absolutely part of the point, but man as creature inside of creation with other creatures, you know, one of the best ways to communicate man as created is having lots of other created things. Yeah. You know, it fits with your other project of trying to get kids to the yeah. world is way bigger than you think it is. Yep. Watch Riot in the Dance. Watch it a lot. Show, right. show kids nature documentaries and especially nature documentaries that don't lie to them. Yeah. So if you, if you sit kids in front of a TV screen to look at beautiful things and the narration is saying, and these are all, you know, the offshoots of chaos and meaninglessness. <laughs> right. You know, here, watch this baby polar bear die. Yeah. And feel bad about your mom's minivan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's a good chance. It's it it builds some nice family culture to know what parts of the nature docs you're supposed to boo at. You know, all together, <laughs> it's like a sports event, but for nature docs. Yeah, where do we cheer? Yeah, where do we boo? Yeah, there's there are so many strange animals, so so many strange animals. Yeah, in what? the world, and like we've mentioned before, bombardier beetles are a thing. You know, they exist. Insects with fireballs, flying foxes are a thing. Mm -hmm. I've seen them. It's bizarre. Yeah. You know, dogs with trash bag Crazy. wings flying around. Yeah. It's just. Yeah. What what a weird creature. Yeah. it's And it's super cool. I mean, it's really, really amazing. Skin wings, right? Yep. Yeah. So it's not any sort of like insect. I don't Skin know. wings. Yeah. and the, But it's also, if I, I think I'm getting this right, but I'm no biologist. If I remember correctly, just like with bats, the wings are actually stretched between the fingers. So there are these really long, elongated yeah, right. finger joints. And then you have kind of the leathery black trash bag and then flying foxes they have a fox head that's orange and then these incredibly long fingers out both sides that are webbed with wings and it's just it's just bizarre and i've seen flying snakes and i've right know, whereas you compare with say birds or maybe pterodactyls they've got the the wings stretched between the arm bones right i think if we're doing that is i think that correct? uh i don't remember with pterodactyls but yeah. yeah birds is a different you know very very different right. thing but yeah it's there's so much stuff and there's so many bizarre things that I think cannot be understood apart from, and this is obvious, but apart from trying to look at a creator and an author. And so when you look at marsupials, you know, trying to come up with some origin for when they became non-placental and when their, the two right. halves of their brain were no longer connected and like distinctives of marsupials. And you're like, okay, so Things with pouches <laughs> must <laughs> pea-sized babies. That, yeah, that grow. Things with pouches must have all descended from a thing with a pouch. All one, there was a thing with a pouch, and everything descended from that. But one of the, it's it makes far more sense, and it's much easier to process if you say, "Well, this is God's marsupial phase," <laughs> like this, is, <laughs> like you would with an artist, where you're like, "This yeah. is his blue period." Yeah, like this is his things with pouches phase. And you see that with lots of other creatures too. This is his things with eyeballs, with sight. Yeah. You know, things with sonar, things with sight. Right. Like there's well, a lot Dar of different Well, Darwin things. was talking about eyeballs. Like that was a big thing for him. He didn't see how his theory worked with eyeballs. Because right. it don't. It doesn't. <laughs> and it's similar. I mean, that whole idea of you need to have a marsupial that is, it has, it's the first pouchy one and it conferred a <laughs> massive generational benefit to the marsupials. Yeah. So they kept it. Yeah, exactly. So the but the there's a lot of beautiful things about this. So if you if you said things that see light, you know, but they're able to they have vision, courtesy of light, they must all be related. That leaves you with compound eyes and like light sensitive cells that don't actually do much other than just sense the direction of light versus 360 vision on a dragonfly. Yeah. You know, versus us. And it's, but these, the equipment of the eyeballs are completely different. Right. And then the light spots too. Like there are yep, certain creatures, exactly. like bacteria, right? Yep. Or uh, amoeba have yeah. a light spot. So you, you say the equipment here is entirely different. The result is entirely different. But God was clearly working with a theme. Yeah. You know, like this is, there's a thematic connection here as opposed to us atheistic scientists trying to make sense of how they could all have descended from. Right, you, see, with yeah, you, you look at the pictures and see how they compare the dugong flipper with the bat wing yeah. and they try to say, now clearly these are analogous yeah. <laughs> analogous uses and they came from the same thing because they all have fingers. Dugongs and bats yeah. have fingers. And the dugong 
I think, doesn't it? Yeah, it has a lot. I'm trying to remember who, who all belongs in dugongs. Yeah. There's a big breadth, but they're all kind of like niche, weird, <laughs> weird little niche critters that. With those little sucky mouth mouths. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's strange. There's a lot of strange stuff. But anyway, all this circles back to God made weird animals and he made man in the middle of them. Yeah. And so I try to duplicate that in every way I can. Right. So is that why you decided, like, why did you decide to switch to documentaries? Why did you, why did you move over? Why the riot and the dance earth? Yeah, I never did decide to switch to them. Actually, there was a, um, I wish I could remember the restaurant, but I took my wife out right before, I'm trying to remember, were we engaged? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, we weren't married yet. So we were either in the brief period in which we dated or the brief engagement. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I took her out and she was talking, asking me what I wanted to do. And I gave her a list. This was in the year 2000. I kind of rattled off a bunch of things I wanted to do. And the included in that was Christian nature documentaries. So I'm going to write novels. I'm going to write middle grade novels. I'm going to write fantasy for kids. I'm going to be involved in TV and film. I'm going to, I want to write at least one book of nonfiction apologetics. No, it's with Tilt World. I want to make Christian nature documentaries. It was like that was the, it was all on the list from this one date that I just rolled out to my wife. And it's been really funny to me how God has opened the doors to tackle stuff like this. Because in the year 2000, when I was saying that, the technology didn't even kind of exist. So the access- Like which, which technology? Oh, for filming? Yeah, the fact that I can, I can now, the barrier to entry is so much lower. I don't need you know, a giant 35 millimeter camera and highly proficient underwater divers with 35 millimeter or whatever they, whatever Jacques Cousteau was using back when he was struggling, you know, like the barrier to entry with film and all that gear uh, is so much higher than it is now. And now, you know, we have quality. It's about the ability to execute, not about the ability to get the tech. Mm. The tech is easy. It's what can you do with the tech? Can you actually execute? So, gotcha. So, so but it's you, always yeah. it wasn't it okay. wasn't a pivot at all. You know, it was something on the on the shelf of targets. Okay. That I, that I have always seen as kind of dovetailed in with why I pull in weird critters into my fantasy as well. Yeah. And I, the same thing, especially in the Ashdown Burial series, but in cupboards too, but especially in Ashdown. And we're not supposed to be talking about my books yet, but we are. We'll circle back. Maybe this will provoke questions that you all can send in. I try to use a lot of historical characters who people assume I'm making up and some enough that they recognize John Smith, Robespierre. That they know that ha- like they should be looking like these other these other people are from history, and I'm giving them like fantasy backstory, but I'm pulling them in from God's narrative. I'm plagiarizing right God's storytelling. So these people were real. The Vlads were real. Radu Bay, for those of you who've read, real dude, like actual dude, brother to Vlad Dracul, ah, who converted to Islam that. and became the commander of the Janissaries for the Sultan's army and was involved in actually sacking, destabilizing and destroying the Dracul power in Europe. So it's a, it's a really weird thing, like, man, that guy's real <laughs> and this guy's real. And I'm going to, of course, I'm really taking a, a lot of liberties in how I execute with them. And some of it is just thematic and I'll I'm just going to save that for later when we talk about Ashdown yeah. explicitly. Yeah. So the, the magical creatures, the things we see in scripture, the references to things in scripture, our minds are very tiny. Our imaginations are very tiny. And so reading the Bible and the references to satyrs and dragons and Leviathan, and behemoth, and these descriptions are, you know, it's, it's incredible. It's fantastical. It's not, it's not straight up. And you have to realize it's not just up the middle materialistic. There's always more to it. And we don't have to get to descriptions of cherubim and seraphim in order to be dealing with some wild, wild critters. But bear in mind that scientists are always dumb right up until they're not. You know, a default setting of skepticism is not always the path to wisdom. And so, you know, it's one of those things we should, we have to remember that gorillas were on the list of crypto, you know, cryptids, cryptozoology. Nobody believed that gorillas were real. Oh, really? For a long time. Nobody. Okay, because we hadn't been to the Congo. <laughs> yeah, because, the European kings hadn't sent explorers there. We'd been told the explorers who did get there had been told that these things existed, and they said like stupid natives and their their myths. 
And it's funny because as we're in a time of a period of like hypersensitivity about white imperialism and colonialism, if you want to know what white imperialism looks like, it looks like white people not believing black people when they tell them what's in the mountains. <laughs> it's like <laughs> we showed up. 600 it's like, pound. Yeah. It's like, we don't believe you. You're liars. We show up and we just deny in South America, we deny how big an anaconda can get. We still don't believe the stories. We won't acknowledge right. how jumbo those things got at different points. And then Africa, we just denied the exist existence of gorillas for yeah. a long time. And it was, I think in the late, I want to say the 19th century, it wasn't until the 19th century that Whitey decided that gorilla was real. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, Whitey is still the keeper of what is and is not real. And, the, and Whitey does this from tenured Whitey positions at Whitey universities there you where go. they are wildly patronizingly progressive. So, yeah, you know, it's very, one of my, uh, speaking of nature documentaries, I, I did see an interview once with some, you know, I don't remember if he's from Portland, Oregon, but he may as well have been this white professor, environmentalist, trying to explain to natives that they need to not be angry at lions and they need to preserve lions and not be threatened by lions. These are people who are struggling to make ends meet to survive. You know, they're trying to, they're trying to continue to exist. Whitey flies in from Oregon, <laughs> from Portlandia, yeah, to let them know that they need to have a better attitude about lions. When it carries off their cow. Yeah. And actually he, he asked, I remember one specific clip where he asked a woman why she hated lions so much. And her answer was because a lion attacked my son and kills my cows. <laughs> which are pretty good reasons. Like, which means, <laughs> oh, and then he, you know, later tells the camera, it's like, we're still working on their attitudes. These poor, ignorant savages, you know, it's just, it's so patronizing. It's so painful to watch. And it's so perfectly an example of white imperialism, but because yeah. white imperialism that lines up with progressivism is totally okay. You know, we can go in there and insist that they be using greener energy. They shouldn't be burning manure or whatever. Right. And it's just like, it's so horrifyingly patronizing. But uh, anyway, all that to say, gorillas were in that category of cryptid until the white man gave it a stamp of approval. So apply that to the native legends in our area about Sasquatch. Yeah, actually, I think it's uh, ridiculous to think that there's not something. So there you go. We heard it here. It's, I mean, I think whenever there is a thing that's elusive, there's gonna be a ton of fraud and a ton of lies and a, right, you know, right. a ton of fake sightings. But the simple fact is enough people have seen, you know, seen creatures like this at different points who are credible, you know, who did yeah. disbelieve. And also you can, we can go back to native totems and things like that and native mythology in the Northwest. And there are a lot of references, you know, to this monkey, yeah. monkey man. And you can see a primate face will show up on a lot of totem poles right. from centuries ago. Yeah. And it's recognizable. We can look at it and recognize that is like, okay, that's an ape face. Yeah. It's like a, you know, a gorilla right. orangutan kind of looking thing. Yeah. So anyway, I think for us to say, to just disbelieve uh, out of hand, everything is again, wildly arrogant. Right. So and to we, disbelieve a particular to... account is oh, different. Yeah, different. To disbelieve in thousands and thousands of accounts over centuries like uh, a little less reasonable plus i mean we know pronghorns can run so fast, fast. <laughs> like too fast for our current yeah. like there's no need for a pronghorn to be able to run this fast other than the god maybe one of them too but then you find out i think this probably was from the riot in the dance you find out that there were at one time cheetahs yeah in north america which a pronghorn would need to run fast yeah, it's like so why <laughs> Why do we have like top speed prey yeah. that can outrun all predators? In a place where we do not have top speed predators. I mean, what's yeah. our fastest? We've got a wolf that can run. 40? Yeah, you're 40 yeah. tops and pronghorns are up to 55, I think, or 60. Yeah, they get up there, close to 60. They're in that neighborhood and there's not much reason for it. Grizzly bears aren't trying to you know, chase them in the open <laughs> plains. Yeah. What's it for? I think other, it could just be for the pleasure of God. That's obviously yeah. what a lot of this is for. But when you go around and you look at the creatures, elephant seals, if we had never seen one, we wouldn't believe in them. And I've seen them when I've sat on beaches and I've eaten PBJs on a blanket with my kids next to one. Yeah. You know, it's, 
it's a giant slug from Star Wars. I mean, this is yeah. just a fantasy creature. Right. Sharks are absolutely fantasy creatures. Squid, anybody? Octopi? Like, come on. That reminds me, no spoilers, but the, the Nautilus, enormous yeah. Nautilus. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that for a bit? So, okay. So, this is jumping into the Silent Bells currently publishing in Serial, where I use Nautilus as these giant guardians of uh, a watery passage. And Nautilus are just truly, fully bizarre. It's right, because like they're shelled, but they yeah. have an enormous number of tentacles. Super clumsy, but not. That's right, because they shoot backwards, right? Don't yeah, they? they sort of swim shell first, but kind of weirdly backwards and predators, you know, and very, very sticky tentacles. They're not using, if I remember correctly, they're not using suction cups at all. It's just a, it's a stickiness, you know. An underwater stickiness. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to double check that, but it's, um, I'm sure you're, that's in my flitting memory, uncle, uncle. but you know, there's for a long time, people denied the giant squid was a thing, you know? And I remember looking at a picture as a kid of a, of a sailor showing his scar from one of the suction cups that was like, looked like a big letter C on the front of his torso and like wrapped around under his arm to his oh, back. Wow. So a suction cup that had like been big enough to wrap around him. And yet forever, we was like, yeah, you know, They don't whatever. get that big, yeah. Sailors are so superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that, that kind of thing has been always the way of the academy. So my agenda is always to open eyes and to try to read stories and tell stories that will expand imaginations. But also in expanding imaginations, it expand awareness of the creativity of the world around us as much as is possible. Right. So- I modify things a lot, but so does God. I mean, look at murder hornets. Look at <laughs> squid and octopi. And he has a uh, Walter Kern when he was out here, a uh, recent guest on this podcast, and among other things, was saying how when really absurd things happen to him or he witnesses them or crazy stuff happens, he has to put it in nonfiction because nobody would believe it in fiction. In fiction, he has to be more reasonable and, you yeah. know, and, and like ask mm. less of his reader that they would suspend, suspend disbelief. So he has a, a story about a bear breaking into his father's house three days after his father died and spending hours in his house, walking from room to room, touring the house, opened a window screen without damaging it, got onto the kitchen table with all the groceries, didn't touch any of the food, the fruit, the sugar, the honey, just is on camera walking around his dad's house three days after his dad's death for hours and then leaves without damaging anything with no defecation, no you're, you know, no you're in nothing. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you put that in a novel, no one would buy it. Bears don't act like that. You know, they're super destructive, super curious, would eat everything, you know, rip your fridge open. But because it happened to him, right? He can't use it in fiction. He has to use it in nonfiction where people can call him a liar and disbelieve. But there he has video. So <laughs> <laughs> So that's funny. So the verisimilitude of fiction is less than real yeah. life. Like we're willing to believe less yeah. than even things that we can test with our Correct. observation. Which is why I like writing fantasy because people are buying in at a slightly higher level of suspension and disbelief. They're coming to you saying, I'm here for the fantasy. And so I insert Gilgamesh and John Smith and, you know, and uh, some snakes from Pliny and Herodotus. And Leon. Yeah. And Leon from the swamps of Florida. So, you know, like that's, um, side note, I love that Leon has a backstory that's not explained kind of sort of like Tolkien's door, <laughs> sort of a theme of the podcast. I feel like, didn't I explain Leon somewhere? Surely I've oh, said that. Oh, you probably that. did. Surely I've said that Poor somewhere. Poor reading comprehension from- No, it's probably a throwaway line. There's probably one line that, you know, uh, James Axelrod or Jax, the zookeeper probably just throws out yeah. an aside. I don't explain why Leon loves cheese so much, but, uh, he does the giant snapping turtle. So the, the point for me of magical creatures is to alert kids and readers to the existence of really fantastical creatures in this world. Yeah. And I want them to think of themselves as fantastical characters in a fantastical world. Right. So that's ultimately what everything comes down to. Yeah. So takeaway, I guess, would be to open your eyes on the animals yeah. that are around you. Little kids love basic animals. They're excited yeah. to see the bugs. They like the cows. Really my sons will spend forever outside just watching one bug that we've all seen a million times. And yeah, that's, just, hang, just hanging out. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I think there was a, 
there was a an insect documentary a long time ago called Microcosmos, which I really, really loved. And it had this ex- incredible operatic song uh, that it used, which consisted, the chorus consisted of open your eyes before you die. And it was like, wow, like, okay. I think that's, that was a, a theme stated. Open your eyes to the past, open your eyes to history, stop patronizing other cultures when they tell you something exists. Like, hear them out. You know, like, actually yeah. hear them out and investigate. And the other, we should be embarrassed that we didn't believe in gorillas, basically. That should be embarrassing to us, yeah. but it's not. I mean, we, we all do that with miracles right now. We don't have time oh, yeah. to get into that, but reading Bede and all the yep. miracles he said happened, I know it's hard for me, even though I know this, it's hard for me to believe those things. Yeah. And, and they can discredit themselves by talking about how many finger bones of St. John they had. Yeah. You know, and the relics and other stuff. So there's, and obviously a, a native culture could tell you lots of things that you end up saying, yeah, that's not true. That's right. false. You know, explaining the eclipse or whatever. But we do the same thing. You know, we try to explain the tides. We try to explain gravity. We give it names and mythology. We just give it a materialistic name and materialistic mythology to make ourselves feel safer. Yeah. So, you know, a little more comfortable. Like we, we explained that. It's like, no, we, we did not. Yeah. We still live in an inexplicable world. Quarks. Yeah. They're quarks. <laughs> it's quarks. That's quantum. Okay. There you so go. So what do we mean when stuff doesn't make sense at a, at a <laughs> fundamentally at the, small level, fundamentally <laughs> small theoretical physics level? Well, that's, it's quantum. We have a word that just means magic. And it makes us all feel better. Yep. Exactly. I think you talk about that. Is that in notes or is that death by living? Notes. Notes. I think. Notes from the Tilted World. So anyway, we kind of covered the animal thing. Why do I use fantastical creatures? Mostly I try to heighten real ones, uh, historical ones, mythical ones that I think could have been real. Occasionally, as in the Ragant and 100 Cupboards, I just make something up completely. But notice that all I did is take a rhino, a real thing, make it basset sized, a real thing, yeah. and give it giant goose wings also from a real thing. So, yeah, I mean, slight collage work, but it's not like I was working, you know, whole cloth, whole cloth from nothing. Yeah. There's only one person who does that. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Is that enough for today? Did we cover the animal thing? We did. Perfect. And send in those questions. Send in the questions. uh, We're going to talk about space trilogy soon. That hideous strength, especially the place to send those questions is Brian's personal email or my work email. (laughs) We should just Brian's cell phone number is (laughs) exactly docs myself. (laughs) (laughs) Brian at canonpress.com or you can also send them on Twitter or on the Facebook page for stories or soul food. Just get them in. Just get them in. We'll find them. And if they're criticisms, we're going to delete them. We don't listen to those. If they're questions, then we might answer them. If they're compliments, we will for sure include them. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. The end. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. If you're someone highly invested in kid fiction and finding the best stories for your kids and you haven't downloaded the Canon app, I want to encourage you to download and subscribe today. You can find things on there such as Christine Cohen's The Winter King, Ethan Nicole's Brave Ollie Possum, Peter Lightheart's Wise Words, a book on Narnia from Douglas Wilson titled What I Learned in Narnia, and much, much more. Download the app today wherever you get your apps and subscribe.